well, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Jessica Rowland. I'm the Network Senior Specialist on Inclusive Peace based here in New York. And we want to welcome everybody to the Network's Inclusivity Community of Practice. It's our second meeting of the year. And today we're covering the topic of synergizing peace tech inclusion and SDG 16. Um, this is actually in connection to the ninth multi-stakeholder forum on science, technology, and innovation for the SDGs that is now uh, going on in New York as we speak for the next two days. So we really wanted to hear um, more about what's going on in the area of peace tech um, so that we could all think more about how to align it with inclusion in our peace in our um, peace building work. Um, it's very active online um, if you want to be using social media to tie it into the forum today. So the hashtag that I've been seeing for the forum online is hashtag tech four, as in the number four SDGs. I'll put it in the chat, um, but we can be highlighting um, our meeting during uh, to, to highlight and connect to the forum itself. But um, today we'll just as an overview of the agenda, we'll be hearing from some uh, experts working in the area of peace tech about their work or, and, and other opportunities and ways that people can get involved and, and tie it to what you all are doing. And then we'll have a Q&A and then we'll um, do a, a quick breakout room session to hear from everyone else how they're doing peace tech in their work. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it to our meetings facilitator, uh, Rashida. I turn it to you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, hi, everyone. And what a wonderful welcoming remarks. Um, without no further ado, um, let's uh, welcome our project presenters and let's delve in into their um, impactful peace tech projects. Um, knowing that each presenter will be having around 10 minutes and then I would invite the participants in the room to drop in their questions and then go for the Q&A. Um, and starting with uh, Peter Mbando, who is the founder and the executive director of Digital Agenda for Tanzania Initiative. Um, thank you for being here, and I would um, give the floor to you to tell us more about your work. All right, my name is uh, Peter Luis Mbando. I'm the founder and the uh, executive director of Digital Agenda for Tanzania Initiative. Uh, it is based in Tanzania as a non-profit organization. Essentially, my organization is dealing with uh, uh, internet governance and um, digital rights and one of our work is, is is all about to impact the community on the digital inclusion because we believe that in the offline life it has already happened in the digital life so whatever happening in the offline life it has gone into the digital life so in diplomacy, uh, our organization is dealing with uh, digital peace and cyber diplomacy. We are overseeing the dynamics and the emergence of new policies, uh, topics in the diplomatic negotiations, uh, topics uh, including cybersecurity, data protection, privacy, data governance, e-commerce, cybercrime, and AI governance. And in this, uh, when it comes to cybercrime conversion, uh, our organization was one among of the observers at the cybercrime convention in Vienna last year. And uh, at the New York, uh, our organization uh, 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 attended the fifth session of the Open Ended Working Group on the ICT, uh, which was formed by the U UN, uh, UN uh, uh, Council uh, since 2021. Uh, this was under the fellowship of uh, European Union Cyber Diplomas, uh, um, under the European Union uh, Institute for Security Studies. So uh, here we were we were discussing about the how we have been in, into the cyber uh, diplomas, but we don't have a framework of the cyber uh, cyber the general framework of the cyber guide guidelines. Uh, that can can get us uh, into peace initiative. As we can see, that the hybrid there is a hybrid war right now, and there is no any any convention which is leading us into peace. On AI, on AI governance as well, we see that we are just receptors or users of AI, but we don't know or we don't have policies or frameworks. Essentially, when it comes to a global south, we are lagging behind on that. We are just users. 
So on the use of digital tools in the practice of diplomacy, essentially social media, online meetings, like this one we are doing, uh, uh, conference big data and the AI analysis, there is no framework at all. Otherwise, probably uh, countries that were adopting GDPR, there are some frameworks like GDPR. Um, uh, in Tanzania right now, we have Personal Data Protection uh, Commission and as well as the Act. So these policies can change the political, social, economic, and technology in which diplomacy is conducted. So uh, in a digital peace uh, and the re redistribution of power in uh, international relations, digital foreign policy, cyber mediation, cyber conflict, digital interdependence, and the sovereign, we are engaged at the international level and the regional level. For instance, right now I'm at the regional level. I came for the United Nations uh, C CSCO meeting, which we are preparing for the summit of the future, which will be held in New York. I hope if we will get some partners who will be interested to support some of the uh, of the colleagues here, uh, it will be fantastic because all the framework that we are we are discussing here is the inclusion of the uh, civil society, uh, because at a high level only government states they meet, but how do we see ourselves on the ground? For instance, the peace uh, network, the peacemakers network. How do you see yourself on the upcoming, the future of the of the summit? Have you engaged? And for instance, today, uh, one of the topics we are discussing on the on-site work, workshops was the sustainable um, development and financing. Uh, essentially for us, uh, in our part of international peace and security, uh, science, technology, and innovation in the digital cooperation or the global digital uh, compact. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the, I will share the link, the topic that we are discussing today in different uh, in different uh, workshops. It's essentially uh, overseeing the, the topic of today, uh, which is also going, which is also um, happening in New York. And uh, I, I think that you shared the area, I think my colleagues went through it. Uh, it's um, it's a, a bridging, a bridging of, uh, of uh, responsibilities that calling for the action. And it has been seen that there is a big skipping from the government, uh, government or states on in the implementation of peace and essentially when it comes to the digital era. There is top down and there is no bottom up. So vertical communication when it comes to PC uh, negotiations and the other issues about the technology is affecting a lot. If we could have a horizontal uh, conversation like this one, which is there is no uh, top down, uh, there is only um, uh, there is no vertical vertical means of communication that is only uh, engaging engaging the community uh, engaging the society engaging the states a multi with uh, I can call it multi multi stakeholderism multilateral stakeholderism that will be much better because every voices will be uh, heard and uh, something will come up in concrete and which will help the world at all because we, uh, five five years from now, the SDGs are going to an end. But what have we so far achieved on the peace, security, and so on? And on the partnership, what have we so far partnered to ensure that we reach the goal? So Digital Agenda uh, has been doing that, but under the 25 years, we have um, outreach, uh, STEM outreach. Uh, this I'm not going to touch it because it's just on the local level. But our initiatives are on our websites, but I can share the link where later on. You can just digest it from our activities uh, that we, uh, we have been doing in cyber diplomacy. And uh, at the regional level this year, our chairman uh, represented at the Cyber Agora. This is the timekeeper, please let me know how many minutes I have. Uh, Left, I needed to talk just uh, shortly. Uh, the Cyber Agora, the EU Cyber Agora, which is the multi stakeholderism, which was happening in Brussels, is where we see the impact of, um, of uh, di digitalization in Europe and the frameworks. So I would like to thank everyone in case you have a question. Uh, I, I leave it to the moderator, then I'll be here waiting for for your contribution question. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, you're definitely on time.
Um, I encourage everyone to look up uh, into the links shared um, and share their perspectives um, and questions for the Q&A afterwards. Um, very insightful. Thank you so much again. And now welcoming um, Michael Giviranti, the project associate at the Global Peace Hub, part of the School of Transnational Governance. Um, thank you for being here and the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, as I'm sharing uh, uh, some slides, uh, hopefully you can see it. Um, I want to thank you for, for inviting me, involving me in this uh, community uh, of practice. Uh, so thank you, Jessica. So I'm an academic, uh, I come from academia. I work for the European University Institute, which is uh, an international organization uh, in higher education. So I, I don't bring certainly the practitioner uh, perspective. And so I'm pretty much in uh, listening mode to learn from you how you apply um, uh, inclusivity and, uh, and digital peace building in, uh, in your organizations. Uh, but I will just give a, a brief overview of uh, where we are, what we're doing, and uh, how this relates a little bit with inclusivity. So the Global Peace Tech Initiative uh, sits at the Florence School of Transnational Governance, uh, which is a school that um, in Florence, Italy, uh, trains uh, current and future leaders from all over the world, especially Africa, European Union, but also, of course, Latin America, North America, Asia. And uh, all, uh, it's also a platform for uh, policy dialogue. Uh, so we bring in uh, policymakers from Europe and beyond to discuss the most pressing issues. And I think it's the perfect place to to have an initiative like this and um, advocate for peace tech and uh, and make it more mainstream in the in the policy uh, debate. So, what is peace tech? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, the definition of peace tech uh, really depends on uh, um, on who is using it, and the exact boundaries are uh, debated, discussed uh, by practitioners and. Uh, in academics, so there's no uh, there's no uh, definitive answer. Plus, there are many labels that uh, are uh, very similar to peace tech, uh, digital peace building, tech for good, peace innovation, social impact tech, tech for social cohesion. Of course, all these labels uh, underpin different initiatives with different objectives, but somehow somehow it's good. Uh, somehow they overlap, and it's also good to acknowledge that, that there's like. Um, a growing uh, network of different stakeholders from academia, um, uh, public and private sector, of course, civil society organizations that are working uh, somehow, uh, even if uh, not in a connected and coordinated way, on uh, the regulation and the use of, of use of technology uh, for peace in different ways. So that's just to start with. So what we've done, we started to map this space, uh, both conceptually, you can't read anything on this map because it's too uh, densely populated, but uh, you can check it out online. Um, so we mapped the peace tech as a topic with all the connections that it has with different uh, ideas uh, in the field. And we started to map a little bit the organization's uh, initiatives working uh, under this umbrella of peace tech. And this is a collaborative map you can also contribute to adding your own uh, digital peace building uh, peace tech initiative. Just to give you an example of some of the initiatives, of course, some of them have to, uh, um, they have to do with the inclusion, uh, like uh, the you, your United Nation uh, Innovation Cell uh, use of AI uh, in mediation for, for large number, uh, large scale consultations, but other are not related to uh, digital technologies uh, uh, for inclusion. Uh, for instance, we, we had some uh, use cases on um, apps used for witnessing atrocities and used uh, in court later on. We had use cases on uh, early warning data uh, for, conflict for conflict prevention. Uh, c warn is an example in East Africa. But you also have things about robotics, drones, uh, blockchain, and uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, and games for peace, which can also be used for inclusion. But the point is that this is a very broad uh, um, field. And uh, when you look at the, the connection between technology and peace, you have many different technologies. And each of these technology uh, has its own specificities, uh, governance challenging, challenges and risks, but also opportunities. 
And of course, also peace as a concept is very broad. So uh, some some uh, scholars might focus on uh, negative peace or, or the role of technology in implementing peace agreements. Uh, but peace is, can also be a positive peace idea of having a harmonious relationship in society, which means um, affecting different processes from uh, uh, strong institutions to low level of corruption uh, to many different things, including inclusion, education, dialogue, uh, strategic communication. So what we do uh, in general is uh, two things. Uh, one element is research for sure. We, beyond mapping, we're trying to analyze these initiatives. Uh, to build some uh, strong use cases that we can use as a policy recommendation and and uh, and uh, a case for also public and private investors to know this case is out there, it has been used, uh, it works. So uh, to bring more attention to, to to these use cases, and the other thing is um, policy dialogue. So we uh, want to to be a platform for policy dialogue on on peace tech and. Uh, to bring together three actors, which are the people that do the stuff on the ground, so civil society organizations, local actors, with tech companies that don't, that don't necessarily know about what is going on, and, uh, and but they have a lot of capital, and the policymakers, which I can assure you, they have no clue about peace tech or digital peace building um, per se. So that's the kind of uh, triangle that we're trying to uh, facilitate as a platform, as a, a academic platform, which is uh, independent in nature. So going back to inclusion, um, of course, some of these technologies can contribute to inclusion. Uh, as I said, I bring an academic perspective, and of course, other people will speak more about uh, concrete cases. Uh, inclusion and peace. Uh, so inclusion uh, um, can contribute to peace in different ways. Uh, Inclusion can help build a, a more legitimate uh, peace process. Uh, it can help empower and protect specific groups like uh, women or uh, religious minority or other groups, and also transform some of the power symmetries or uh, uh, the social, social political structures that uh, that has uh, some uh, uh, minorities or marginalized groups um, as as uh, uh, as uh, affected by the conflict. Mm -hmm. um, you have many use cases. For instance, I mentioned this from uh, one another scholar of this topic building, which is uh, Andreas Hirblinger. He studied this topic uh, thoroughly and he, he uh, listed uh, 14 or 15 um, different use cases uh, in the use of technology for inclusion in peace processes. You see many different things here, which, which, which I cannot go uh, uh, in depth, but of course, online focus groups, public digital consultation, uh, pooling to review and have feedback on draft agreements, and uh, digital campaigns, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I also want to highlight another internal example in our in our school. Um, one of our students uh, decided to focus his dissertation on Digital peace building in uh, in Yemen, and it found different cases um, about that. Uh, very relevant, I think, to to our conversation. Um, uh, he, he found about a social media dialogue platform like uh, Manasati Thirty, uh, which was also done in collaboration with the media outlet and uh, to discuss some of the pressing topics. Uh, you see uh, Arabia Felix with the uh, with the GIZ, with the Ger German Development Agency. Uh, there they use mobile games uh, for uh, to foster cooperation. You see uh, peace building courses on WhatsApp uh, from Safer Safer World. You see uh, the participation of Build Up that we have here today with us in uh, consultation uh, through WhatsApp, and also this uh, um, AI powered. Uh, dialogue um, that I was mentioning before that, that was done in Yemen. So all these things, they raise different uh, sort of questions. Uh, inclusivity is a good thing, but it also comes with uh, with challenges. And of course, also the use of technology uh, to promote inclusion and peace processes, it, it, it has its own um, challenges and, and issues um, that we can uh, discuss. And actually, the other thing I want to mention to conclude is that um, 
it's a kind of mantra that uh, we have uh, be, uh, among peace tech people, uh, uh, which is that uh, tech solutionism is uh, the enemy of peace tech. Um, it can be, you know, um, something weird to hear to hear first, but of course, um, uh, we with the peace tech we focus both on mitigating the risks related to these technologies, but also to crucial to uh, uh, enhancing the opportunities. But when uh, de devising this innovation, this application, and studying uh, what the practitioners do uh, in employing technology for peace, of course, uh, we need to be aware that uh, we don't have to be um, uh, to have an impression of, um, uh, yeah, we don't have to be uh, tricked by the fact that we, we 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 use technology to be more inclusive because in fact of course we can exclude also people so we always have to combine these tech technologies of technologies of course with offline participation and when we use these tools we need to reach out to the people where they are of course we need to use tools that they they are using and there's a big risk risk of having this feeling or impression of inclusion while in fact we are excluding people that don't have access to the technology, the infrastructure, the know-how, et cetera, et cetera. So what I would like to hear from you and uh, also discuss today is uh, this kind of balance between taking some risks, of course, in implementing these innovations uh, in, in, uh, in peace building using technology, because you have to take some risk, of course, uh, while still uh, keeping in mind this uh, do no harm approach. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's something uh, I would like to hear from you that uh, you're doing the thing, and uh, and I'm happy to to be here and and to listen from from your experience. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. You have introduced a lot of interesting concepts, and definitely about the intersection between peace and tech. Um, I encourage everyone to drop your questions or insights regarding um, your presentation. And now we can move to uh, Julie Hau, uh, who is the Digital Peace Building Lead at BuildUp. Um, and the floor is yours. Okay, so I um, work with BuildUp, who and... I am very happy to be here today. Thank you for the invitation and thank you to fellow presenters, Peter and Michelle, uh, for setting the stage. So Build Up as an organization is a, we call ourselves a digital first peace building organization. We've been around since around 2014, which in a lifetime isn't that long, about 10 years, but in the world of digital innovation, we've seen many different eras of digital peace building come and go. And we like to say that we use new tools for old problems referring to using tech for sort of perennial problems of um, social conflict. And we use old tools for new problems, which is that we also integrate arts and creativity in the world, um, but we also conduct research and uh, develop technical solutions as well um, that are open source and available for other peace builders to use. So I'll share a bit more about that. Um, this uh, alludes to what Michelle kindly introduced, which is that it used to be the case that we would think about digital technologies as just a tool. Um, it's just a tool that we can use for good or bad and that they're neutral. Um, over the years, we've really come to understand that technology is not just a tool. It's not neutral. In fact, in many ways, it's tooling us. And that informs the types of approaches that we need to take to it in terms of understanding um, the real impact that it is having on conflict dynamics currently, and then working to mitigate those and transform them. So why digital peace building? Um, our argument to this is that all peace building is and should be digital. We shouldn't think about this as a separate area of practice per se, but that it's one that we can mainstream into our existing peace building practices because we know that offline interpersonal conflicts are having an impact in online interactions. And at the same time, online interactions and digital spaces are reciprocally shaping offline relations and dynamics as well. And that's just talking about the sort of social aspect and not bringing to bear um, all of the additional um, 
ways of weaponry and offense that um, technical systems are bringing uh, in terms of warfare and sort of closing that gap between warfare and citizen warfare and the protection of citizens therein. And so just to say that um, technology is sort of fully integrated now uh, and peace building should follow that lead in integrating it as well, not having it be a, a separate standalone sort of topic of interest, if you will. Um, Michelle uh, introduced some really uh, useful frameworks for understanding what digital peace building is. We've also we've um, typically used sort of these three functions to organize how we understand digital peace building or peace tech. Um, that there are these three functions of technology, and those functions can be used for peace building. Um, and so, therefore, we see projects about digital peace building fitting into these sort of three areas being either data and data management, where you can gather, analyze, analyze and visualize data differently, and um, strategic communications, where peace builders are using communications to bring more or different people into the conversation and share information, or in dialogue and networking, which also includes sort of mobilizing as well for social movements. This is creating new spaces where people are able to coordinate and collaborate. On the flip side, though, these functions of technology also have their negative aspects, and these are the harms in which um, we are working to mitigate against. Um, at the same time, data is used for surveillance and, and micro-targeting and ways to manipulate individuals in order to create division. Uh, strategic communications are a source of um, or maybe not a source, a signal and as both a signal and a source of conflict where we see hate speech and misinformation and disinformation and the sort of strategic use of communications to um, increase divisions. And finally, um, towards our dialogue and networking, um, we're seeing that it's sort of closing down spaces for that, where we have a, a, a potential for increased connectivity. And um, we're seeing these being used as recruitment forms of to, recruitment forms for violence or opportunities for deconstructive dialogue, not constructive. We've been thinking about this in terms of a metaphor, and this comes from a, a policy position paper from my colleague Elena Puslaroy, who has kind of compared polarization to carbon emissions, where if you can think of carbon or pollution as a negative externality of the industrial age, meaning that when a company goes to create, build chairs to sell, they're not meaning to create polar, they're not meaning to create carbon, it's just a negative externality or it's a byproduct of what they're doing. In the same way, polarization has been the sort of byproduct of our digital age. And that's something that we're trying to get a handle on. So all of that is framing to say what we do as an organization. We have these four um, program areas, if you will, um, surrounding belonging and social cohesion. These are dialogue initiatives. These are initiatives that are um, bringing people together around common causes, mobilizing issues, initiatives, et cetera. Um, digital conflict drivers. This is looking at those harms that I had mentioned and mitigating those, also creating a social media analysis open source tool that people can use to begin to mediate those in their own environments as well. Democratization and digital democracy. Um, this has been the injection of technical tools into deliberative spaces, whether that's formal elections or other decision-making processes. Um, Michelle and his um, conversation in Yemen mentioned a consultation that we did using WhatsApp in Yemen. That's one example of this, but there are many others. Probably the biggest area of work for this is in Somalia, so I'm happy to share more about that. And then to kind of support all of this work, we do research and, and tech development. So just three examples, if I have time, of some of that work, and then I'll give you links where you can see the rest of it. Um, I mentioned that we are building a tool, This we call it Phoenix. It's currently a code repository, so it's an open source series of tools that peace builders can use to be able to do social media analysis. If you are trying to do things like understand or shift narratives in your community or understand how these um, how key actors in your conflict are using strategic communications to further the conflict or the opposite. 
um, this is currently a code repository. And so it requires either our support or you to have a sort of a technical person on staff. But by the end of this year, it will have a user-friendly sort of front end and be available um, for anybody to be able to use. So just a flag to that to say, watch this space. Um, and another example that sort of exemplifies our belonging and social cohesion area, this is work ongoing now in the Netherlands in which um, young people are moving through an online dialogue process, receiving training in how to be an upstander online, and then responding directly to instances of racism in Instagram comments, which is quite prevalent in the Netherlands. And so this is a way of um, sort of empowering people to be upstanders rather than bystanders in the conflicts that they're in, in this case, the Netherlands. And we've done similar projects like this um, in the United States, um, in Kenya, uh, and have had partners do sort of do build offs of this other places as well, Iraq included. And then finally, we run P. Yeah. So to build their tool that they have in mind, essentially, or to build out their process and then to use it. And we sort of accompany them through that process. The one I put here is Syria and Yemen because it is current, but also current. We have fellows in Burkina Faso and, Malo, and Mali and Niger and um, other places as well. So this is sort of a way of um, integrating technology into existing peace building practice on the ground. OK, there's a, a few ways that you could get involved immediately and resources available to you. And I'll put these in the chat. One is the Digital Peace Builders Guide. This is our collection of sort of every instance that we know of that people have used technology in their peace building work. And we've organized it in a really innovative way so that you can sort of essentially go to the tool and say what your goal is and then find what tools might work for that goal. Um, so that's useful. We also have topical online trainings that are free on our website. You can take them online or via WhatsApp. Um, these trainings include Digital Peace Building 101 if you're brand new to this, but they also go into more depth if you are, have a, a key area of interest. One of them, for example, was developed with the UNDPPA Mediation Support Unit, and it's um, about digital inclusion of women in peace processes. So that's kind of an example of the topical nature that you could find there. And then finally, we host an annual conference. It changes locations every year, and it brings together these elements of peace building practice, technology, arts and creativity, um, and I think is a really generative, fantastic space. This year will be in the Philippines, and so you're all more than welcome to join. This last year it was in Kenya, um, yeah, and it moves. So if the Philippines is too far for you, then maybe, you know, watch it for the next year to see if we if it moves a bit closer. And it's kind of a great way to keep this sort of small, tight knit um, community of people doing peace tech or digital peace building together. Uh, if you have any further questions, I'm happy to answer them here and then feel free to email me afterwards and I'll put these links in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. That was really interesting. Um... Amazing. So now we can move to a short Q&A before going to our next breakout room sessions. And I invite everyone to type in their questions or simply raise their hands and speak up uh, with your insights as well. Um, delving into the chat, um, we already have a couple of insights slash questions. Um, we already have uh, Shane, Judy, who uh, wanted to know more about the Yemeni initiative. Uh, thank you so much, Michelle, for answering. I invite everyone to uh, check the replies for further answers. Um, and if Michelle wants to add anything on that, you're more than welcome to do so. So yeah, unfortunately, uh, this research really was developed developed by one of our students. Uh, it's not open access. Um, it was a choice of the student. Normally, these publications publications go online. I don't know, I don't know about the personal reasons why he decided to do so. Uh, so I, I cannot speak for him. I, I can speak. I can speak for what I read, uh, which was like. Um, very interesting. It basically, uh, take like uh, an in-depth dive into these five cases uh, with interviews with the actors and organizations that developed these initiatives. Um, so it was it was a 
grounded on interviews and, and qualitative research. And uh, he found evidence of um, uh, a transformation of, of power um, uh, symmetry, symmetries and asymmetries there uh, in this context. So um, he explained how and, and, and why this uh, kind of redistribute power from, from, from international um, organizations and to local actors uh, somehow. And also, I remember we made the distinction between uh, international international partnership partnerships, so partnerships between international uh, um, entities uh, like big media outlets and international organizations, and international local partnerships. Seeing the second one uh, as more more effective, um, but yeah, that's that's uh, that's only my my takeaway. I remember from from last year when he published this. Um, but uh, we would need to invite him to present his research next time. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, yeah. I, I've seen another question about biometrics. It's really kind of a uh, um, new thing. Uh, there's no evidence still. Uh, it's uh, the the biggest part of the debate is about the risks of these biometric systems. The opportunities relates to digital identities and how you can this can help manage uh, maybe migration flows or um, actually the the um, the possibility of giving identities to displaced people. Uh, but at the same time, the, the the most part of the literature is critical about uh, the about it and. Uh, uh, highlights the risks uh, of these biometric systems, who is going to uh, own the data, how this data will be managed, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's still very, I haven't seen like uh, um, definitive publications on this, but uh, when I go to forums, it's something that we, we're starting to discuss because some of these technologies are available uh, and it's mostly in the migration sector. Thank you so much for sharing. Sorry, um, not... remind that these are forbidden yeah. under the AI Act. So this is something we can't do in the European Union, in theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much again. Um, let's look up into the raised hands, and then we'll get back to uh, Hannah, after Abdel Karim, and Jessica. Um, let's start with Abdel Karim Shifu. Um, the floor is yours for your question or insight. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's a, it was a good presentation, and I think uh, people, practitioners like us working on the ground, uh, will be very much interested in how um, these tools uh, could be used properly uh, to bridge uh, a lot of divides. Um, there is a project currently going on that we are running, and we call it um, bridging bridging the divides. So, and, you know, conflict are that actually divided a lot of uh, people based on religious and cultural lines. Uh, and uh, we need technology now because there are some areas that we have. So the most important thing is how can, the question anyway, is that how, based on the links that have been sent, how can we have a proper training of, you know, practitioners, a proper training workshop that would learn about this and be able to make use of them. So we need to get uh, some links to this training online and also uh, we need if there is need to have physical training uh, we also need a situation whereby do these tools can be readily made available to us uh, to track conflict and also uh, you know like scale up our early one and early response system and also uh, integrate more into the community most especially how do we get some of these uh, tools to work in the remote areas where there are no, uh, you know, no opportunity for internet and so on and so forth. So thank you. Thank you so much, Abdul Karim. Um, I'd like to give the floor to any one of the project presenters to answer or share any insights. I could start, and then also would invite Peter, while not mentioned, who I know also has a lot to say on this. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, Abdul Karim. Sorry, I want of... to say Julie, Julie, Julie. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yes. 
Um, to say I completely agree with your assessment that more training is needed in this. And this is hard where peace builders are busy and have often have low resources and are really strapping things together to make it work. It's the reason why we've made training sort of a really key aspect of what we do. And so I would invite you to check out the free online courses. One thing that I think we did that was interesting is uh, make that the introductory courses available on WhatsApp in part, in large part, because of the ability to deal with low bandwidth environments. And so really people anywhere could access this training. And I know that that's just a small piece. Um, uh, but just to say, I hope you try it. And then we'd be really interested in your feedback to see whether that you know, is enough or not, or what is the next step after that? And I'm just interested in working together to understand, okay, how then do we do the build on trainings into, you know, um, in person if need be, or how we can be in others uh, in your area as well. But that is a really common question about how can these tools work in low digital tech environments? And um, the short answer is that they can, and people have been doing digital peace building in low tech environments for decades at this point. And so, yeah, it's just a matter of sort of connecting people to those existing examples so they can see what's possible. Anything to add maybe from Peter? Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, I would like to speak about the utilization of the cyber diplomacy, especially uh, right now, if you see that even in the government itself is using e-governance and uh, uh, some of the meetings that they are conducted, uh, they are promoting even the equity and equality of participation of women and the persons with the disabilities. Uh, however, uh, when you look uh, in the uh, global south, especially in Tanzania, for instance, you can see that in the parliament, we have more than 142 uh, women who are members of parliament, but who are, who, uh, then they are doing uh, really good work on the community. However, uh, due to the threats, the, all, uh, the threats of the digital digital platforms, uh, they cannot share their work because of the cyber bullying, cyber uh, hate speech, uh, cyber hacking, and cyber threats. So it has become like um, only ten, maybe out of one hundred and forty-two members of parliament, only ten they are utilizing to show their work. Um, and the way they are utilizing the, the digital the digital space. So uh, lack of information to their constituents, to their people, uh, citizens, it's very huge unless maybe in the, uh, at the local level, but at the national level, we cannot know the other constituents uh, a member of parliament uh, is doing because they are afraid to be threatened uh, uh, by uh, cyber predators that we, we see in, in, in this, in, in this uh, digital era. So one thing I would like you to, to emphasize is that whenever we are doing uh, digital uh, or cyber diplomas, we should ensure there is a digi digital security uh, training uh, and the dynamics of the internet, we should also cope with it. Because if we are letting them like just use it, for instance, right now we are in this big platform right now, but there are cyber predators, we don't know, they are looking for it maybe to, to, to hide do anything as to ensure that maybe the meeting should not go on. But because of the security that we it has been enhanced, we 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 we, we see right now that it is going on very well. So if we if we press the button of of, of ensuring that hate speech, we bring the hate speech out in our platforms. We have policies that is. Uh, protecting women, persons with disabilities, protecting all, not only women, all of us, because we are all the digital uh, citizen, uh, 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 digital citizen in, 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 in this era, they are contributing more. Something very little can happen and the global or the digital uh, journalist can just, or a citizen journalist can just uh, post in the social media or they can just start a conversation. So all, all of this uh, and the hybrid war and so on should come into the conversation that the truth that we are using should also be moderated and somehow uh, should be de decentralized to ensure that there is they are used uh, amicably uh, and to ensure there is peace. Thank you very much. For Thank you so much, Peter. Um, that was really insightful. Um, now we can go to um, Hannah's question. 
um, if and Hannah is part of the Outright International. Yeah, Hannah, Hannah is impressed by the incredible work and uh, work already with the LGBTQ population. Uh, Hannah wondering, how do you see your digital tools as including LGBTQ communities and have um, already been examples of this? And another question um, for Julie. Uh, I wonder if there are any programs such as the one you mentioned in the Netherlands for addressing hate speech against the LGBTQ people. Yes, the short answer is yes. And uh, in reply to your message, I just put in some links. Um, we don't have great write-up of this work, but it is happening. Um, a key example of this was we worked with Stonewall in the UK, essentially in how they were understanding like how to engage with the trans rights debate in the UK, which at the time was very heated, and their membership was quite divided. And so that is an example of work that I linked. Um, I would say uh, maybe like towards your motivation of your question that this is still happening, I think less than other digital peace building work. And so well, I can point to a couple of examples that I linked in. Um, I don't know of, you know, a great amount that deal with that. So yeah, thanks for your question and hope those links are helpful. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, a lot of interesting resources. Any other insights? Otherwise we can go with um, Yasmin, who has raised her hand. Um, let's see with uh, Zaydamin question. I wonder if your experience engaging or speaking with the fundamentalist group, how did you handle to speak with them, especially those who don't like to speak uh, of peace? In the meantime, I encourage everyone to drop their questions or raise their hands since we have some few minutes for that. I can try to jump into this. It's a really tricky question, Zaidun, so thank you for asking. Um, I think it depends on sort of who you're wanting to talk to and what your goals are for doing that. There are a number of there are a number of really great initiatives that um work with kind of former extremists to then use those formers as credible messengers for current extremists or fundamentalists. Um, you could look at, I'm trying to think of just off the top of my head examples that you could look at there. Um, uh, it'll come to me and if, and if it does, I'll put a link. There's also been digital initiatives to kind of interrupt paths to fundamentalism or extremism. Moonshot, for example, developed this redirect method where if people searched on Google or searched on Facebook for um, sort of extremist groups, they would get a, a, a warning message that essentially said, like, you searched this, but would you rather look at this? And then they also did it on YouTube, where people were watching sort of a a, a video that could lead people towards extremism. Um, then they worked with YouTube to sort of redirect their suggested videos afterwards to sort of pull out. So those are that's an example of one. Um, there are other cases um, where... Uh, Gosh, I'm trying to remember who did all these. So, okay, so um, the Institute for Strategic Dialogue had a project where they did kind of one-to-one -one, um, responses on social media and forums to also pull people out of extremism. And they have a great report about how they did that as well. Um, all to say that this happens and I think reflects the challenges of doing this also in offline environments. Um, though integrate sort of new ones, which is that um, uh, these people are often found sort of in different places and more underground uh, in the internet forums, et cetera. And also it's kind of a key area of recruitment. So it's also a place of real importance that peace builders are learning about how to engage with in that space as well. So just a few examples off the top of my head, but I'm curious if others yeah, have more to add. Thank you so much, Julie. If there is no other presenter would like to share, we can go to uh, Jeronim and then to Abi Dali. Um, Jeronim, you have the floor to ask your question. Thank you so much. So my name is Jeronim Obwar and I come from Kenya. Um, I, 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 had, I kind of like have a question. Uh, just regarding this digital tool, I agree it's a very it's a very good idea and. Uh, 
would really wish for more people to be receptive to the idea of just uh, using this. But I have a question, like uh, being that we serve uh, the community members who are, uh, let me say, some of, uh, some of the target groups that we target are kind of like vulnerable and really want to get this digital tool to them. So how do we translate uh, this so that can get it so easy for them to consume and even use? Because we talk of matter space, so the community members are the ones who are um, they suffer, like they are the victims of, of violence and stuff. So how then do we get them to use this to more, I mean, in a way that is so easier, like, like it's us we're getting it here, but then it's the community members that we serve are the ones supposed to benefit more than we benefit. So how do we get it to them? Thank you for the question. Um, let's give it to one of our presenters to answer. In the meantime, we have Abdi Dali and then a um, question from Jessica in the chat. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Abdi Dali and I'm a, a lecturer at Peshawar University where I uh, just teach uh, subjects uh, related to peace and calm studies. Uh, my question is that uh, there are certain uh, social media apps that uh, spread violence are uh, uh, like uh, there is a TikTok uh, live gaming. Uh, where, uh, whenever you perform negative activities, then uh, your live uh, uh, many members will watch you. So such a apps uh, also uh, um, uh, uh, destroy our society. The, uh, I have also noticed uh, that uh, there are a certain, like I have also a raised question in the chat that uh, uh, the digital media also um, uh, helps in polarization, in uh, politics polarization. I have noticed that uh, there are certain uh, pages that only had, uh, um, uh, only spread hate, and the young people, young youth, uh, they just follow those. Uh, pages and uh, 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 you know there is a social construction occurs. Um, there are uh, certain pages uh, that uh, just um, uh, support to uh, uh, spread hate within the society. Uh, there are uh, also other uh, things uh, uh, like um, uh, uh, there are certain uh, extremists, uh, extremists uh, um, are religious scholars uh, that spread hate within the society. But if you uh, report that, then um, many uh, days uh, uh, it takes like to uh, uh, remove the that video that is spread hate within the um, society. So I think the within uh, uh, the within the digital digital media, we have to take notice on these things uh, like TikTok live gaming, uh, uh, where you can perform uh, negative activities. Then you are. Uh, um, uh, members will go, uh, grow and uh, you are uh, so we have to um, uh, also control this kind of uh, apps too. Thank you Abidali for sharing um, your insight that was very really interesting maybe I can jump in on, on the both um, and also mm -hmm. the space for others um, so the former question was it you your own name um, it was kind of like how do we get it to the communities that we're working with I think that require that's a longer conversation, which I would love to sidebar with you on. Um, but what we found is that like often the just the framing of that question just needs to shift a little bit to what technologies are my community members already using and how could those be utilized to meet my peace building goals, whether that is increased training, increased mobilization, increased dialogue, et cetera. Um, because we found that the initiatives that kind of work with that framing have been much more successful than ones that try to import new tools, if you will, or build new platforms for these communities. So that's just like my two cents and then we should have a longer conversation. And just to um, uh, respond to uh, Abid, just to say, like, you're really right to recognize that this is a big concern and you're sharing some examples of how, you know, this uh, is impacting people and is transforming rapidly. Like a year or two ago, you know, maybe this wouldn't have been an issue on TikTok, but this is sort of the importance of staying up to date. Um, because, yeah, these sort of emerging dynamics of conflict are um, rapidly changing. And so peace builders need to be keeping up with it rather than, you know, five years later, you know, being able to point to something as something we could have intervened in um, if possible. So, yeah, you're just really right to recognize those as concerns, I think. Perfect. Thank you, Julie. 
Um, would like to know if anyone else wants to add in. Otherwise, feel free. Yeah. Yeah, maybe uh, I will add also a comment to what has been uh, presented here and um, all the questions. And um, I mean, it's a it's a it's a long conversation, as Julie said. Um, yeah. But I've seen like some some it's also in the chat some ideas about you know uh, tech is not working. Sometimes it's making the process more complicated, and it helps. So this idea that um, um, tech does not work per se, or sometimes it's it's a problem because we don't have the capacity to use it. Of course, um, uh, you need to be trained for that, but also, yeah, have the infrastructure to, and, 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 and uh, yeah, the infrastructure to, to, to use it effectively. So that's, that's, that's one idea, but uh, to try like to, to broaden this, 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 this perspective, that, that's true, of course, it's coming from, from, from your experiences. And uh, as an answer to this, of course, I agree with, Ju with uh, Julie that um, you need to work with the tech tools that people are already using and also digital peace building as an idea. It's putting the emphasis on, on the peace building part. So uh, on, on, on achieving the peace building uh, objectives with the with digital tools, tools that you have, including low tech, uh, which means all this innovative innovation, AI might be uh, sometimes a bit uh, flashy, but not effect effective. Um, but at the same time, I would argue uh, from a non practitioner perspective, um, that there's like an upstream problem and a downstream problem. So the upstream problem is, you know, about how technology is designed and how this design can affect uh, our societies in, a, societies in a positive or negative way. And uh, that's a whole thing. And uh, to embed uh, principles of do no harm, sorry, principles of um, peace by design in the development of technologies. Uh, because sometimes the business-driven model that underpins all these technologies can lead to very detrimental effects to not only peace processes but you know our societies, information, democracy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's one problem, and uh, we're discussing discussing heavily, having heavily with uh, also build up uh, within uh, the Council on Technology and Social Cohesion, which addresses this specific topic. Uh, but there's also another um, more downstream problem, which is about investments. And uh, what I see when we map these initiatives uh, and uh, we assess them, etc., many of the initiatives, even those that work, don't they don't have funding because you know peace tech is not a thing. Uh, so of course we should not be too excited about tech but at the same time i think that peace tech should be equally about involving the tech sector and 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 the public policy in this idea of peace tech so bringing them on board with some with some use cases and um, this will help uh, funding will help like creating new programs also at the european level and uh, at the public level national level for instance i see the netherlands and germany now have a uh, increasing attention on the use of data for peace, peace building in general. Um, and so it's just to echo what, uh, sorry, I will conclude, uh, what echo to what Peter said, uh, for me it's crucial. Uh, it was talking about, uh, so basically don't bring in technology if you don't have like the policy uh, to, to have a safe adoption of this technology because ad technology is a, a double-edged sword and it can, you know, bring negative or positive effects. And I have in mind this uh, UNICEF initiative, it's called GIGA, is try to connect um, many uh, young people to the internet. And there's a lot of money behind. Uh, but of course, when we uh, do this kind of things, of course, we need to be aware that without the proper policy and the proper um, uh, capacity building, it can be really detrimental hate speech, uh, cybersecurity, for interference, you name it. Um, so that's just a general reflection. Let's not throw uh, all the peace tech out of the window, uh, even though it is true that uh, sometimes it can be more problematic than a, than a resource, yeah. That was insightful, Michelle. Thank you so much. Um, now we have a question from Jessica around peace mediation negotiation processes, um, saying that 
We know that digital mediation negotiation processes are increasing, but the problem that I see is that in the online space, it's harder to build trust between the parties. How do we address this? Maybe giving the floor to Peter um, to share any insights and also inviting anyone uh, within the expertise of peace mediation negotiation as well uh, to share any thoughts. Thank you. Uh, I would like to, to emphasize on the representation of CSOs at the international level, uh, international level, meaning at UN, UN level and uh, regional level, that um, we should not stay down with our ideas, their innovative ideas, and so on, even if we are threatened by any kind of authority, because if you bring those ideas at the top of these bodies, international bodies, they are more uh, authoritative to push the agenda very easily uh, 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 to the to the state level, where state level sometimes they, they, uh, it's because of the illiteracy, uh, digital illiteracy uh, among ourselves, including myself. Sometimes there are some tools, some things I don't know. So. If we bring those voices and those frameworks and, and uh, those strategic and technical solutions uh, at the high level, it will be easier for them to decentralize to the lower level. And we should not uh, just be waiting for, for things to happen. I think uh, partnership with the key, if you see your partner has, has more has more has 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 more engagement of uh, pushing the idea to the to the to the regional or uh, international level. You, you should cooperate. Uh, so cooperation without the compromise is much better. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I wanted to just input into Jessica's good question about you know questioning mm -hmm. how that works. Um, I would say that there's sort of two processes to attend to there where your question could diverge? Are we talking about kind of track one high level political process mediation or rather this sort of, you know, connection of maybe civil society or other groups that are happening at different levels? And then, you know, all of it, you don't have to take the full course. But what I think is valuable about it is it has um, four examples of the, you know, first Thing I mentioned where mediators have been involved in these sort of high level negotiations that have used tech just talk about that experience and it's like you know 10 minute videos each and I find them really interesting um I think maybe just like the use the inject that I would have to that is that um with either of those but with particularly mediation processes um it's where that uh online interaction would be the only tool and I think that that's useful actually like to our larger conversation is that we shouldn't think about kind of like tech or not tech. We shouldn't be thinking in that binary, but that often these programs like have this hybrid approach where you can think about like, is the strategic use of technology in this instance one that helps with just this one specific piece, you know, whether that's kind of like a priming the pump or a follow-up afterward even, or a way to stay connected in between these kind of like offline processes that we have or something like that. And so that's how it's been used sort of in this, these mediation environments as well, that it's been supplemental, if you will. And that sort of helps with that trust aspect for sure. I would say just like one other inject that is useful is that um uh my experience with this has been in sort of lower level civil society dialogue and consultations but i think having a facilitator is really really important just like you're having wonderful rashida here who's keeping the conversation moving um i think it like in an offline environment you wouldn't ever sort of just put people in the same room who are in conflict or tension and say like, work it out, right? Like you would have a mediator facilitator there who structures that environment. And the same, if not more structuration is needed for online interactions as well, which includes sort of those same hallmarks of setting up the room, setting up sort of the containers of speaking, establishing norms and processes, like all of that is really important. And so, um, which I think sometimes we forget when it's like, oh yeah, it's just a video call. It's less meaningful or something like that, but a facilitator's role is still really important. Indeed. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, since we have very few minutes left, let's just get back quickly 
to be comments and then you're gonna have um, another breakout rooms where you can share more about your thoughts. Um, we hear from Hayato saying that's a great uh, Julie, the discussion on the intersection of peace, technology, and inclusivity in SDG 16 has highlighted the critical importance of collaboration approaches in addressing complex societal challenges. Um, Hayato looks forward to exploring how these insights can be applied to the unique context of Nigeria to promote inclusivity, mitigate insecurities, and drive meaningful progress toward our collective goals. And then we have from uh, Dalin uh, saying that I have been working uh, in the peace building space for a while, but recently have been engaged in technology facilitated gender-based violence. So I find this discussion quite important. Too often tech is seen as a Panakea, <laughs> but in reality creates as many problems as it solves. Um, and then we have from uh, Naam Patience. Um, thank you for the amazing presentation. I would like to know how we better strike balance between protecting freedom of speech and preventing uh, hate speech and online um, harassment. If anyone wants to jump in and then we have Final question from uh, Hayato. Um, Hayato also sharing that, um, uh, asking how can we uh, harness the potential of emerging technologies um, such as AI and blockchain to effectively promote peace building efforts and inclusivity uh, with communities affected by conflict, particularly in regions like Nigeria, where traditional approaches may face significant challenge which I apologize <laughs> yeah sorry Rashida I had a I had a delay um uh just to jump into Hayatu's question and then please mm -hmm. please others do as well I think that this is an interesting question it I think it rises from we're having these issues with traditional forms of peace building or peace processes in this area like how can tech you know help to solve that which is like a really good motivation. There's something about um, this that just makes me want to say like technology also isn't always the answer as I think Dellen also mentioned and, you know, alluded to, and it's certainly not a, you know, a panacea or panacea. And um, yeah, I think, sorry, what I want to say is that we should only use technology when and if it is strategic to our peace building goal and purpose. And then we should select the tool based on that goal and purpose. And so this happened with blockchain a few years ago where everyone's like, ooh, shiny blockchain chain. This is like a brand new tool. We're going to integrate it. And then we failed to see sort of any meaningful like strategic uses of it. It was interesting. Thank you. Uh, one final intervention from Abi Dali. Uh, kindly be brief. Um, before moving on to the breakout room session. Abi Dali, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. right here. Okay. Uh, yes, actually, my uh, question is that uh, um, uh, we have also noticed that uh, cyberbullying and online harassment, uh, mostly the social media apps uh, has been uh, uh, proved as a pretty ground for hate speech, bullying, and uh, uh, harassment, which uh, also causes uh, uh, emotional dis uh, distress and even uh, driving individual to violence or suicide. Uh, like uh, mm, like uh, there are many cases has been reported within Peshawar, uh, where I live, uh, even uh, many people have committed uh, suicide due to online harassment or uh, due to uh, these media apps. So my question is that how to um, how to control or how to overcome these kind of uh, things like uh, uh, these cases are being increasing day by day uh, here. So just briefly, um, I wanted to add on, uh, I still believe that on, on, on the previous point as well, that uh, there are some uh, use cases to be explored uh, on blockchain. The problem is that uh, the tension in blockchain has to do with cryptocurrencies and these kind of things. And until they, they, are, they, are, they are the main focus of the, the use cases, um, 
we cannot explore other things like uh, humanitarian aid, for instance, uh, that can go directly to people in need with uh, a transparent uh, and tracked um, um, path, uh, avoiding the money going to uh, intermediaries or corrupt the elites or these kind of things, or even for identities uh, and verification against transparency of processes. Still, it's something that is not used uh, for digital identities. They use uh, the main use is uh, um, with text, uh, with uh, sorry, double uh, how's it called double um, yeah, identification with your mobile phone uh, and face recognition as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, I guess there's still, still something to explore there uh, on the peaceful side of things or social impact side of things. And for AI, I already mentioned that uh, there's AI powered uh, early warning systems and it's very used for uh, make sense of big amount of data, but the data needs to be first publicly available, second um, um, clean and uh, understandable and so it's uh, this, this this discussion about AI for uh, for analytics is also about you know how 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 you store data how you organize data if the data are actually useful for what you have to analyze and but AI is also used uh, to spread this information misinformation hate speech but also to fight it so there are a lot, lot of initiatives that are also financed in the EU and and also a uh, big uh, very large online platform have their own. Uh, AI programs to fight uh, hate speech and uh, mitigate hate speech. So it's really a battle there. So between people using it to spread hate and people to to mitigate the, these effects of this information and, polariz uh, and polarization. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's the comment, yeah, sorry. Indeed, thank you so much. Thank you all. Now we can move. Um, this insightful discussion to the breakout rooms and uh, now we're going to have two or three I believe to which you're going to be answering two questions that we're going to be sharing in the uh, chat. Um, feel free to join in and enjoy the insightful conversation. I um, would like to hear from um, each breakout room facilitator. Um, you'll have three minutes to share with us the main takeaways Maybe we can start with uh, Fariha. Okay, thank you. Uh, so in our breakout uh, session, uh, we delve into the question that uh, about our work experience uh, on peace inclusion in our work and how uh, what challenges we have faced so far and how we have mitigated this uh, so uh, we discussed uh, with it all and uh, we got some wonderful work experiences and challenges and uh, the procession on mitigation. And uh, we are eager to present our findings and, uh, and challenges to you. Uh, so uh, one of us uh, discussed uh, about their works, work experience on the digital literacy and um, how uh, he had managed uh, and organized seminar social media um, seminar on social media abuses especially for the common people and the young people who have faced so far and we have who have the power to mitigate this so they have uh, they have spread uh, the digital toolkit uh, to promote digital literacy because uh, in peace tech uh, inclusion, digital literacy comes first for a digital, uh, a peaceful digital platform. So uh, also uh, they have also they have uh, worked with uh, three hundred wa wonderful young people they have mentioned so far, and uh, also they have worked with the ethnic people. And one of us uh, shared uh, the graphic uh, designing, uh, the wonderful work experiences so far, and uh, how uh, how to make visuals. Uh, she described that uh, for uh, safe online places, and uh, she shared uh, about her work, uh, how it uh, going uh, through learning and relearning processes uh, in her work. 
and uh, one of us uh, discuss about the challenges uh, related to peace, culture, religion, alerts, and internet access, especially in third world. Uh, this is must uh, that uh, internet access uh, is not available for everyone. So this is the main, uh, this is a very uh, big challenge. Uh, for us, we uh, who worked in community people with community people. Uh, also, uh, one of us um, discussed about uh, how uh, this tech inclusion can be a hybrid process, a hybrid uh, solution, uh, and uh, also the online concerns I have discussed and. Uh, and one of us, our presenter, uh, discussed her about her impact, impactful one of her, one of her impactful uh, projects, uh, like uh, online media intervention, social media intervention program, and how she um, organized uh, the polarization camp, uh, and uh, how how to um, spread uh, social media, how to spread uh, the digital awareness and social media awareness uh, to young people. And uh, basically we uh, discussed it and also uh, how the um, digital literacy and other thing that uh, how the young people can uh, put their effort on digital uh, literacy and uh, can, can be able to make themselves uh, uh, take uh, in, uh, expert in uh, this, tech, uh, this technology. Uh, so we have uh, discussed so far on these topics and thank you for listening to me and uh, from group one. And, and a big thanks uh, from group one to all of you. Thank you, Fariha. Um, that was really interesting to know and I've been hearing a lot of um, interesting thoughts in the room. That was really uh, fruitful and just amazing. <laughs> um, now I would like to give the floor to Sara Rahman to share about um, her breakout room. Yes, thank you. Uh, so breakout room two, um, we had really good conversations about um, how the work has been in, or how tech has influenced work in both specific and in general ways, and then also some of the challenges they faced. Um, so to start with, uh, one really fun uh, specific challenge, or one fun um, inclusive way that peace technology has been utilized is by transitioning a, um, a physical library and allowing a hybrid library to accompany a physical library. So this was done in Somalia uh, alongside a website and an app to make the peace section of the physical library more accessible wide scale. Um, additionally, there's been tech and digital tools have been used to build awareness and map out areas to indicate safety, uh, while social media has been used to gather information and opinion polls. Um, so as a starting basis and also as like follow through with uh, the steps during the peace process. Um, online campaigns um, that have been used have been used to engage youth. Um, so tech has been used as a res as a tool for resource and uh, knowledge gathering to further the interfaith approach, um, specifically including youth with disabilities and dialogue. Um, so that's one specific way that it's been used in Indonesia specifically. So uh, we also bring together youth um, by tech makes it easier to bring people together uh, to discuss developments of the region, playing a role in facilitating partnerships and communications within the region, again, looking at youth. Um, and then also by empowering youth to give necessary skills through trainings and enhancing critical thinking abilities and leadership skills. Um, so they were able to utilize technology, again, in training sessions, conduct online support and mentorship sessions, uh, sensitize the communities to digital safety. And then another way is through digital storytelling and campaigns um, utilized on social media to raise awareness. Um, so those are some ways that peace technology has been utilized to advance inclusion in um, Breakout Room 2's work. So moving on to challenges, one, um, one overall challenge that we got a little bit into discussion but would love to have furthered if the time allowed was the issues of trust. 
Um, so whether trust can be or whether tech can be used as an instrument to build trust um, or if the trust needs to happen outside of technology and then brought onto online platforms. Um, so another aspect was a concern about um, the challenge of being censored by the government, but then also by other peace builders. Um, and so if you're not in the same room, you're not certain about who is on the platform. I mean, there's 45 people in this chat. I was like, every single person in here, you know, you don't know the, um, the motives of every single person. And so another aspect was, another challenge was that um, so much is invested in the digital tool and how it's being, how it's created, that it tends to not, there's a tends to be a challenge of not um, the rollout and the content and the application of it tends to fall a little bit to the wayside because so much, so many resources were put into the investment of the creation of that tool rather than how it's applied. Um, additionally, the skepticism around digital space and opportunities due to widespread cyberbullying and hacking. Um, and then on just a basic level, the issue of connectivity challenges um, and the less patience that comes with accommodating those challenges. Um, so that's the general from breakout room two. If there's anybody else from my room who would like to add anything that I missed, please feel free to jump in. Thank you, Sarah. I myself learned a lot um, from your summary and definitely encourage everyone to add anything else. And I'll leave it um, for um, uh, Lily Bumili to share her. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Rashida, for the opportunity to share the interesting discussions we had in our breakaway group. And actually, the time finished before we could share all uh, the, the the many um, what involvements from various people. So just to start with the, uh, the, the, what people are doing in employing peace tech, the prevailing uh, point was on trainings, uh, hybrid trainings just to promote inclusion and with the prioritization on persons with disabilities and gender balance. Um, yeah, because everybody is indeed a digital citizen. And then also with regards to what people are doing, um, partnerships. Uh, one of us shared that, you know, partnering with other organizations with a similar theme, but on various uh, themes is very important so that a wide um, a variety of knowledge is gained. And also we discussed digital storytelling as another way to um, you know, promote inclusion with regards to peace tag. And again, um, another interesting point was on peace mediation process, uh, particularly with, with to build trust uh, between you know, different regions. And I, I found that also very interesting because even though there's a challenge of ge geography, but then radio, local radio stations were employed because even if you don't have a, a smartphone or whatever, but you could at least have access to the radio. So in a nutshell, that's about that regarding uh, some of uh, what, the, what people employ. And then with regards to the challenges, issues on misinformation, disinformation, uh, fake news uh, were discussed. Um, and then secondly, uh, an issue of a, a, a lack of knowledge. You know, people still don't fully understand in times on how to operate uh, technological tools. And again, somebody mentioned who was presenting on network connectivity is also a challenge. And at times with this online um, trainings or whatever, you, people sometimes do not easily follow through. So, so those are some of the challenges. And lastly, a lack of in infrastructure such as uh, electricity in very remote areas. Then how do we, how do, what, what solutions have been employed uh, to tackle these challenges? Um, obviously with regards mm -hmm. to geographical barriers, the issue of local radio stations, uh, and also at times net for network challenges, making recordings so that they can be disseminated afterwards and then making follow-ups um, with people as well. And also, um, uh, you know what, sharing with 
sharing tools during training sessions on what to do to prevent spam, how to report uh, anything that is related to hate speech and um, all the challenges related to misinformation and disinformation. And again, with regards to the solutions, especially as in earlier on, I spoke about peace mediation, is where like uh, young people are brought together, young people who cause distraction, they are brought together, capacitated with skills, so that they can rebuild whatever uh, distractions they may have caused. So um, yeah. that's um, about that. And somebody in my group said that um, I think I missed out something. So I don't know if there's somebody who can add mm -hmm. on what I have missed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was insightful as well. And now um, would leave the floor to the closing the next steps. Um, to our dear host, Jessica. Thank you, Rashida, and thank you to all of our facilitators and our guest presenters for all their wonderful insights today. Um, and then just looking forward to our next, uh, our third inclusivity community of practice, it's going to be focused on advancing the inclusion and rights of LGBTQ plus of faith in peace building efforts. And that's going to take place at the end of next month on Thursday, June 27th, same time, where we'll actually be doing a deeper consultation on the Queering the Women, Peace and Security toolkit um, that has launched. So looking forward to seeing you all there. And just thank you again to everybody for um, helping to add meaning and value to this, this meeting.